Hi there. This is Brother Richard. This is Brother Richard. And today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. This will be part <clears throat> 267. <coughs> and today we're discussing the title, The Church Scattered, The Church Gathered. <coughs> Scripture teaches the church, the body of Christ, the ecclesia, came under a judgment for its disobedience to the Lord, just as Israel came under a judgment. The same judgment, scattering, separation, for a time. What was the church guilty of disobedience? Turn to Jude. Book of Jude, verses 1 to 3. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So this is makes him Jesus' brother. To them that are sanctified, set apart by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. So this letter of Jude is to the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones that are sanctified. Not just the, the, the Jewish church in Jerusalem. This is to every single born-again saint in that area, in that region. <clears throat> this is a warning to all the Christians of that day. And he goes on. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved. Beloved. So this is a message... This is a, a, a warning sent in love to his brethren. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. This is the warning. <clears throat> you have received the whole counsel of God. You understand everything because you've been given all the repository of the gospel by the apostles and the prophets. The warning is, he uses the word contend. What does it mean to contend? To contend means to fight. To be aggressive. What is he saying? Contend for the faith. In other words, hold on to rigorously and vigorously what you have received. Why? He goes on to talk about 4, verse 4. There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's warning them about the infiltration of leaders. People assuming authority within the body of Christ that are going to pervert the faith. They're going to water down the faith, the knowledge that the church has already gotten so that they can rise up to positions of dominance and authority over the body of Christ. Yes. Okay, so we see that he's using the word faith. Yes. The scripture says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What you're teaching us right now is faith is the doctrine, the gospel, the understanding that they've been once given. Hang on to that. So can faith and gospel be translated, transferred here in this place or not? <clears throat> yes. It's not the same thing though. He's talking about the body of teaching. It was called the faith. Uh, <clears throat> you talk about a, a person, keep the faith. 
In other words, what you have been given, the, the whole <clears throat> panoply of what you received is called the faith. It's the foundational teaching, the death, burial, and resurrection, the life of Christ, the purpose of the plan of God. All that whole thing being given to the saint is called the faith. Right. Now, what you're talking about is a belief in the word that you have received. What Jude is talking about, what you receive, don't let anybody distort. Mm. That, Pervert. That, of course, includes the Prototicus Doctrine. Most definitely. Let me come briefly <coughs> to the scattering. Yes. So we find that somewhere in the first century AD... Well, we're going we're gonna to go into that. We're going to go into that. I, I, I appreciate your anticipation. You're sniffing, you're barking up the right tree. I can smell it. <laughs> I want some. <laughs> <clears throat> what we want to focus on here now, which is, which is germane to this whole lesson, is this warning. <clears throat> you have the faith. You have the body of teaching. You are the stewards of the whole counsel of God. They are given the responsibility to preserve what they have received so that they can pass it on to the generations to come. Amen. Do you believe that the people who read this today will think that since that they're sitting in the church and actually reading that verse, let's say, in a church, Therefore, they've retrieved what was lost. <laughs> they might, if they're that Cause, deluded. Because you know. If that look, that, you know it's exactly how Exactly, yeah. Right. Well, it's because it's been distorted in their thinking. Yeah. They don't rationalize and understand the results of what happened because the church didn't follow Absolutely. what they were commanded to do. Yes. Literally, the message I'm getting from your teaching, your, your, your instruction, and what this word is saying is that literally... Make this the most important thing in your life. Do not vary. Continue forward. Seek constantly. And don't put anything in front of this. Exactly. Make sure nothing is in front of this exactly. in your life. Exactly. He's, he's pleading with them. He isn't just, you know, this is just a flippant, uh, oh, uh, if you have time. He's pleading with them. He says, this is the most important thing. Earnestly. That you can do. He prefaces it by giving them understanding of who they are. Call, sanctify, set, set apart for God's service. Committed, bought by the blood of Jesus. Well, having established this, he's using this to let them know that what they have been given is the most important action they can possibly engage in. Amen. Now, I'm going to show you <coughs> how complete the faith was that they received. Turn to Second Thessalonians, second chapter. We see throughout the writings of Paul how consistent how provocative the activity of <clears throat> the satanic group of individuals that kept trying to infiltrate the body of Christ was how pervasive it was at the time of the apostles Paul kept having to warn the church about maintaining what they had received. 
<clears throat> now we're going to see the repletion. This is the church at Thessalonica. Second chapter, we're going to start in verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. This church understood the significance of the gathering. <coughs> Organized religion doesn't even recognize the gathering. The gathering, the events. Okay. What's about to take place now. They knew, because Paul had given this to them. Verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter, as from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. So Paul is alive and well. He has just given them the whole counsel of God that pertains to the events taking place in the latter time. He is barely barely the, 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 the ground has barely grown cold from where he's walked on to the next county and he has to write this letter because false teachers have already infiltrated and tried to totally change everything he's just taught them. Notice what he goes on to say. Verse 3, <clears throat> Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man be revealed, a man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, or that, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now remember, notice what he says. Remember, remember, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things things. Paul outlined everything dealing with the gathering, the rapture, and the second coming. They had the whole uh, uh, comprehension of what's called the faith. Jude is warning them, what you have received, earnestly contend for it. Don't sit still for these people trying to distort the Word of God. You know the truth. You know what you've been given. You know the veracity of the apostles. Stand fast in what you've been given. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Where is the writing dealing with the things that Paul gave them? There are whole epistles that Paul refers to that aren't there anymore because the stewards of the mysteries of God didn't count them valuable enough to hold on to them. Turn to Galatians. Wouldn't that be us in their time? Be the us? The stewards. <coughs> yes, definitely. It's a church. No, I mean us, as in our group within the church. Yes, yes. Galatians. Galatians, the first chapter. This was a problem that was consistent. Galatians three. Third chapter. We're going to start here. Galatians third chapter. Yes. Okay. Verse 1. <clears throat> oh foolish Galatians. Now this is a part of Tokus Church. Yes. Oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only what I learned from you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, that you now made perfect by the flesh? Paul had barely left. <clears throat> the Judaizers, the false teachers infiltrated, and they just dropped what they had heard, the truth, and turned to receive what these guys had told them. Paul was angry. He said, you know better. You got the faith. 
You got the understanding because I didn't leave until I made sure you had it. And now look. Turn to Galatians, the first chapter. <coughs> Verse 6, starting verse 6, down to verse 9. <clears throat> I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Another gospel. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So they were perverting the gospel of the kingdom of the heavens during the time of the apostles. Setting up their own traditions, their own teaching during the time of the apostles. Notice what he goes on to say. For though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that ye which ye, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. The word accursed there is damned. <clears throat> what he's saying, if you hear teaching, if you hear doctrine that contradicts Paul's gospel, the person that's teaching that is under damnation. Mm. Paul repeats it twice. Mm. It's not Paul, it's the Holy Spirit. Sure. You get to understand how God looks at what's taking right. place. Right. We are to contend for the faith. Honestly. Now the commandment is basically that each believer is to pursue the faith on his own. Mm. What you have today in organized religion is you receive everything you get from somebody else, an outside source. And believe it, 100%. And even you to believe that that person <laughs> is beyond reproach. Yes. And whatever that person tells you that comes from the scripture, that's exactly the way you should receive it. What is this? It's the spirit of error. Yeah. People believe that pastors cannot sin because they're pastors. So even before they've opened their mouths, they cannot sin. You know, the word pastor mm -hmm. is only mentioned twice in the whole New Testament. Only twice. And once is mentioned in the singular and once is mentioned in the plural. But apostle and prophet is mentioned throughout. Constantly. Where are the apostles and the prophets? Yeah. Foundation teaching. I see a couple. <laughs> so let, let's go on. So the church brought upon itself a judgment because they did not heed the warnings of the apostles and they allowed the faith to be twisted and distorted by individual men who claimed to be somebody. Turn to Acts, the 20th chapter. Starting in verse 27, uh, verse 26, Acts 20. Acts 20, uh, Acts 20, verse 26 to 31. This is how the apostles understood that the church would be infiltrated even before they passed away from the scene. The gospel was being twisted and distorted. Verse 26, Wherefore, I take unto you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. <clears throat> I'm going to say this to those in this room. 
I'm going to say it to you. If you are listening to teaching that does not include the whole counsel of God, then you need to find another teacher. Because you're being robbed. You're being robbed. I'm being robbed. You're being robbed if you don't heed. Paul is saying the person that you're listening to, if he doesn't give you the whole counsel of God, you are not going to make it. <clears throat> but that person who didn't give you the whole counsel of God, whatever happens to you, God's going to hold that person responsible for not giving you what he should have given you to prepare you for the things that you needed to be aware of. Well, in, in union with what you've just now said, Mr. Jones, Philippians tells us, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Exactly. So, if your sole indoctrination to the Scripture is given to you by somebody else, and that's the only thing you're doing, you might want to think about a little, a little deeper than that. You might want to extend a little more effort into pleasing God. Yes. <clears throat> we're going to go into this lesson and show you what we're getting ready to enter into and why it's so important to have been <clears throat> the recipient of the faith, the recipient of the whole counsel of God. Yes. Remember the sketch, right? Yeah, we're going to get into that. Continue on. Verse 26. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Paul is talking to the leadership of the church at Ephesus, the elders. He's not talking to a pastor, he's talking to the elders. Mm. That's who God put in charge of the body of Christ, instructing and directing the elders, of which the pastor is one member. Verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He's warning them. Jude's warning them. Peter is warning them. The apostles warned over and over and over again that when you receive the faith, you have got to guard it and fight to hold on to it. Because it will be taken away from you if you don't. Continue on. Verse 30, Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse, twisted, distorted things to, to draw away disciples after them. Let's go on. <clears throat> because they didn't heed this, judgment came on the church. 1 Peter, 4th chapter, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must first begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of Christ? Judgment falls at the house of God first. Then it goes to the unsaved. Now the history of the church, so-called, is one of people being divided and believing various doctrines because of the teaching of individual men who claimed to be called of God. Claimed to be called of God and therefore took authority to dispense doctrines to God's people. Two thousand years of doctrines, not the gospel, doctrines. They claim to be the, the claim to be the gospel, 
But if you test it, if you check it out by what the scripture says, you'll find it's inadequate. Why is it inadequate? Because it's not the whole counsel of God. That's why. This denomination teaches this. That denomination teaches that. This denomination teaches we're the true church because we keep the tenets of God and those others don't. That means absolutely nothing. When you put the litmus test of God's design, what God declares is the true church. The true church is every single individual that is born again. And throughout the denominations, you have the true church. But they're not together. You say, how do you know they're not together? <laughs> Very easily. You ask each one what they believe, and they're going to give you different interpretations of Scripture. The church has been divided for 2,000 years. Why? Because they brought upon themselves a judgment through disobedience. Then you had the rise of individuals who people put up as, as, as images to emulate as icons. The true church did not follow men. The Bible tells us who you follow. You follow God. You don't follow Spurgeon. You don't follow Luther. You don't follow <coughs> Zwingli. You don't follow Calvin. You don't follow men. You follow Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. These men never taught the doctrine that the Bible is giving us. Number one, salvation is through the new birth. Number two, becoming a new creation and developing that new creation. These men consistently teach about developing yourself, identifying with who you are, perfecting who you are, which is rubbish because it's contrary to what Scripture is. You don't identify with yourself. You identify with Christ. But it's all nebulous. Why do you you say, well, how do you know? Because people are still arguing about whether you can lose your salvation or not. Well, you if you understood what salvation is, you would know the answer to that question. Because you would know what it means to be saved. It means that you have been born again, you are now create a new creation in which you are focusing and developing. But let's go on. We're going to see the result of it. I'm going to have to skip over something because of the time constraints. But I want to show you what the Scripture is giving us as, re as regards to the church being under judgment and being scattered as well as Israel. Israel was under judgment. It was scattered because it rejected its Lord and Savior. <clears throat> it says that Israel would be abused by its leaders. It would be kept in ignorance. So would the church. Turn to Ezekiel 34 verses 1 to 5. Now this deals with Israel. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophecy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophecy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flocks. Ye eat the fat, you clothe you with the wool, you <clears throat> kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. Feed not the flock. Yeah, that answers it. Somebody, the guy that works here. <laughs> the diseased 
have, <laughs> have you not strengthened? Neither have you healed that which was sick. Neither have you bound up that which was broken. Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth and none did search or seek after them. The shepherds of Israel, the rabbis, keep the Jewish people in ignorance. Thoroughly isolated. They weren't even allowed to have access to a New Testament. The Old Testament is so rigidly controlled. The book of Isaiah is sectioned off uh, pertaining to the things dealing with the Messiah and it puts strict interpretation on how you should see that throughout the time of the scattering of Israel the the rabbis have kept the people in total ignorance and given them a false religious faith to uh, chew on Jesus when he came he thoroughly denounced them because he's talking talk to them about what they have done. Turn to Matthew 23. <clears throat> Starting in verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These are what you have to done and not to leave the other undone. Your blind guides would strain in a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within are full of extortion and excesses. So basically, he told them, you look good on the outside, but in the inside <coughs> you are death warmed over. The blind Pharisee, blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup, and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like unto whitened sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanliness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, your serpents, your generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? <clears throat> That's what he thought of the religious leaders of Israel. <clears throat> Israel, by the time of the Lord's coming, was so blind, so in distortion, that God had to take a man, John the Baptist, to get the nation to at least comprehend that the Messiah's time was at hand. Because the scriptures which consistently talked about it have been so distorted by these guys that there's no way they could see it for what it was. Does the Lord see the 
scribes and Pharisees of today in the church as worse than the Jewish scribes and Pharisees. See, it's in the same way. Okay. Because they're doing the same thing. Right. Yes. All right. You <coughs> made a statement which prompted this question. It's said about John the Baptist. Of men born of a woman, there is, has risen, risen none greater than John the Baptist, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So now, of men born of, win, of women, there is not, none greater than John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. How does, what about Paul? Isn't Paul better than John, greater than John the Baptist? Well, Jesus is talking about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant that he was establishing. Remember, he said, <clears throat> the law and the prophets were until John. Now the kingdom is preached. He's saying, of men born of women, there has nev never risen a greater than John the Baptist. But in the kingdom, New Covenant, he who is least is greater than John. I understand that, and you did answer the question, so thank you, Brother Jones. Sure. What we find here, what Jesus thought of religious leaders of his time, he would think the same thing of the right. religious leaders of our time. So they wouldn't necessarily think the ones of our time are worse. Oh, no, they're just as equally keeping the people blind as these guys were doing his time. Matter of fact, he talks about the religious leaders of our time turn over to Jeremiah <laughs> 23rd chapter yeah. they're doing the same thing they're taking the word of God making it of no effect by their interpretations Jeremiah 23rd chapter, verses 1 to 2. This is not Israel. This is the church. Woe unto you, the pastors, that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, if not visited them, behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Mega church, <clears throat> can you get a hold of a pastor there if you need prayer? You can't get a hold of the system. You're on a sick bed, will he come and visit you? No. Can you uh, dialogue, ask a question during the sermon? Or even after the sermon for that matter. My understanding was the pastor is given there to minister to the flock. He's a shepherd. He's supposed to make himself available. He is supposed to sacrifice. Paul is an apostle, founder of churches, and he was always, always made himself available. What's Rick Warren's church? Saddleback. Saddleback. You have to make an appointment, not with him, with an assistant pastor. You have to make an appointment. You can't go and... Hey, how are you? Let's marry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me check my let me check my calendar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't even know the people in their congregation. No. Paul knew everybody in the churches he founded. He made it a point to keep tabs on everybody because he knew the progression of, of each individual. He would have people that he would tell once he left that community of believers, let me know what's taking place there, because he says so in his epistles. No. The Lord would not <clears throat> look upon the leadership of the, this organized religion favorably at all. I don't see fiery leadership anywhere, as, as we used to see in the Old Testament times, in, in the early church times, is what I'm trying to say. And I think that <clears throat> that soft and fluffy behavior of the church is a direct result of people not being in direct contact with that pastor who is able to actually teach them something. Service Christi used to talk about the difference between what would you call it 
uh, shepherds and hirelings. Mm. Yes, I remember. Hirelings, somebody you pay right. to do a particular thing. The leadership of the churches today are not shepherds, they're hirelings. Right. They're not there for the people, they're there for themselves. Isn't that a scripture that says that the hireling flees before the wolf? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Well, let's go on. <clears throat> Scripture teaches <clears throat> the Lord will gather back the church at the same time as he gathers back Israel. The church will receive revelation knowledge but Israel because they have rejected him will only receive blessings. Jeremiah 23 drop down to verse 3 to 4. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, that they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. He cannot do that with Israel. He can't give them revelation knowledge, because they have rejected Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. It's so ingrained in them at this point. You have a you have a remnant messianic Jews that have done that, but the nation as a whole will not do it till the end of the tribulation period. So what he's doing, when he gathers them, he's going to bless them. He's going to give them physical abundance. But for the churches, he's going to prepare them for the things that are coming on this world and for eternity as we will see. Turn to Deuteronomy 32 verse 12 to 14. You see what happens when Israel is gathered. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. Now I want to focus on something here. When are they going to be gathered? <clears throat> you find that verse 10 gives you the background, the time of the gathering. He, the Lord, found him in a desert land, and in the waste howling wilderness, he led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. I'm going to read that again. He found him in a desert land, and in the waste howling wilderness, he led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. The gathering is going to take place out of a wasteland for Israel, and it's going to take them back to the land of promise. Why would it be a wasteland? Now remember, this is global. So all the tribes of Israel are going to be gathered globally out of wastelands back to the promised land. When is that going to happen? Jeremiah 25. Excellent. Verse 26, when you get there. All the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the face of the earth, and the king of Shishak shall drink after them. So all when all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the face of the earth, 
have collapsed. They're all going to be wastelands of desolation. God's going to bring the tribes back to the land of promise. Now we still keep in mind that the gathering of Israel, white rich, and the gathering of the church uh, through Elohim, that's simultaneous, or one comes before another? Simultaneous. Okay. Simultaneous. So, the period of time from the beginning of sorrows through to the gathering is one, the time during which we the teachers give meat in due season, of course, but two, is a desolation all around us. And the hand that covers us, the way I picture it is, we're covered green fields, pastoral rivers and all that kind of nonsense. And then outside of that, this is the desert you're talking about. Yes. Uh, what will happen? The, the, the God gathers his people to regions in which they are going to flourish. Right. <clears throat> Beyond that are those that are under the judgment. Now what we find here, notice what it says in verse 26. All the kingdoms of the world are destroyed. Therefore you have no law, no more nation states. Right. There's no America, there's no Germany, there's no England, there's no Japan. You have no nation state. The nation state has collapsed to the basic family of the human race. You have the tribes of the nations that are left not countries yeah go ahead. is what you just said is equal 32 or after is equal 32 after how long after well it ends with ezekiel 30 it begins with the end of ezekiel 32. It be, what you just said is, is, the, is the beginning ezekiel the, 32 is this is so that's sim simultaneous then yes. so i'm thinking about the the the, the desert uh, desolation is, is what's in my mind. Yes. And we know that that happens after all of the nations in the Middle East do their best to attack Yes, Israel. what you're getting here is the overall picture. All the kings have collapsed. Right. Ezekiel 32 has given you the individual situations with each nation. Right. Here is uh, Lebanon. Right. Here is Syria. Here is this one. Here is that one. They've already been right. okay. judged. Okay. And this is what you're looking at after the judgment. Right. The, the result. Okay. <clears throat> and what's taking place is they are given basically their identities as ethnic groups, mm. not as countries. So then we also see that what you just described is the end of Ezekiel 7, the four corners of this land, but because they have to be same time. Right. Same time. Okay. Everything collapses, the, 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 the identity of the nation state ceases at that point because what you're going to have you do not have the cohesion of a country any longer it's been split down to its essence the people that are within it to survive they're going to co coagulate in their com a, a cultural families again because that's the way man basically is 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 inclined the cultural identity is what's going to hold them together that means that they're going to be gathered not out of the kingdoms, they're going to be gathered out of the nations. Turn Ezekiel 38. And this is exactly how they are described. Ezekiel 38, verses 11 to 12. Now shall say, <clears throat> I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. 
This is because of YHVH. He's taking them, put them in the land, flowing with milk and honey, sure. blessing them to the hilt, physically. Verse 12, to take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, not kingdoms, right. nations, kingdoms have collapsed, mm -hmm. which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. So this is when, you know, Ezekiel 38 takes place long after Ezekiel 32, long after Deuteronomy 32, about 30 years afterwards, people have been blessed yeah. to the hilt. They're spoiled, you know, like a little, bunch of little masons. They want their own thing now, you know. I, hey, hey, you know, I don't like this. Uh, you know, it, it's, I, it, it's not green enough for me. I want something greener, so I'm going to go over here. And that's why HVH making everything fertile. Yes. Makes the place of paradise. That's why God goes in there. Because he sees this rich, fertile land flowing with all sorts of goods and things. They can feed his army. They, these guys can feed off the land perpetually. They got no defense. So he's going to go up there and do his thing mm. until he gets wiped out. Anyway, this is what we see. Israel's gathered back to the land. They're going to build their temple. They're going to establish... The Levite class again. Uh, temple worship is established. This is all going on. Time to Ezekiel 38. The church. We just read Jeremiah 23. <clears throat> it is going to be placed into its communities. It is going to have shepherds raised up to feed the flock. No shepherds being raised up to feed Israel because they can't receive it. Okay. Church can receive it. Israel's going to get bountiful blessings. Church is going to get revelation knowledge. Will the church also be flourishing? Yes, some will. In abundance. Some will. Later to see, and church is going to be filthy rich. Mm -hmm. But to the church, it doesn't matter. They're, <laughs> they're spiritually inclined. They're not concerned. They're going to have provisions uh, in that respect. But their pursuits are going to preclude comfort. So the church will become real as it ever been? As it's ever been. It will be reestablished to, to, to the design in which it's supposed to function. Apostles and prophets overseeing them. The point you're making is that some are materially richer than others. Yes. Yes. So this is the next principle. Scripture teaches the church will receive the knowledge of revelation hidden from men and angels until the time of the coming of those who were called to receive it. Revelation knowledge. God in his wisdom understood that the church, the book of Acts, would blow it even though they had access to revelation knowledge, even though they received abundantly revelation knowledge, they blew it. They did not do what they were called to do. That was to preserve the knowledge for the generations that would come so that the church could perpetually exist. When they allowed themselves to be infiltrated by these false teachers and false doctrines, they were neutralized. When they, neutral, when they were neutralized, it gave rise to the false church, the universal church for 2,000 years. Okay, so that, that really is the scattering as a result of the judgment, yes. what you've just said. Yes. So all the full, I'm calling them false churches, all the false churches are the scattering. Yes. So. yes. <clears throat> what you have is the body of Christ is scattered in them. Yes. With that understanding, we are entering now at the time in which they are going to be free. Just as Israel is going to be freed, delivered out of the bondage of this Luciferian era, so will the churches. 
Matthew 24, verse 46. It says 45. Uh, oh, excuse me, yeah. Stand corrected, 45. Matthew 24, verse 45. <coughs> Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? I'm going to read that again. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. The time in which he is going to give them meat in due season is a time in which they are going to be liberated to receive what he has to give them. Now these are called from eternity authorized to give what the Holy Spirit has reserved in Revelation, sealed from time immemorial, now going to be open, the beginning of sorrows, and given to those that are going to be free to receive it. We must understand that as I look at the scripture, this is what the progression of the Father's plan for his people are. The church is already scattered. He's going to gather them. That's what we call it, the gather into one group and that group is going to be prepared to receive what the Father has had held in reserve for them. So you could say that the opening of the seal is the reality. Well that takes place later on. What's happening here is the preparation for those who interpret the seal when it's open is happening. They're going to be prepared on earth for that time when you talk about the seal being open to witness it and to control it when it's open. Okay. okay. If this didn't happen, that couldn't happen. Sure. Now, I want to point out something here. When it talks about the servant, faithful and wise servant, faithful and wise Servant, turn to Daniel the twelfth chapter. This is very important for, for us to get this. Daniel 12, verses 9 to 10. <laughs> We're talking about the revelation that's closed. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So it was not for the prophets. It was not for the wise of that time, it was for a specific time and of this specific group to receive. Verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, now notice what it says. <clears throat> In Ezekiel 28 chapter, it tells the, 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 the Antichrist, you are, you are wiser than Daniel. Daniel had wisdom. But Daniel couldn't understand this. Why? Because Daniel had a certain type of wisdom. But not the type of wisdom that would be needed to understand this. Turn to Second Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2nd chapter. I'm going to illustrate a principle here. 1 Corinthians 2nd chapter. Paul points this out. There are two types of wisdom.
verse 5 to 7. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Albeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. He's talking about wisdom that is restricted to specific individuals. Use the word perfect, meaning mature. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. I call this the mystery wisdom. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. God has reserved this mystery wisdom to understand revelation from the beginning so that it would glorify the individual that will operate in that wisdom. Now, I'll give an example of these two wisdoms. Daniel had a wisdom which is the same wisdom Solomon had. It is worldly wisdom. But this wisdom is limited. Solomon could not go beyond the world, beyond the earth. That's why he's consistently talking about in Ecclesiastes everything under the sun. He couldn't see beyond worldly wisdom. Even though the wisdom was good, it was genuinely beneficial but it dealt with a human-oriented wisdom. Yes. As what was given to the Antichrist. Yes. And Daniel. The wisdom, Paul talks about this mystery wisdom is the wisdom to comprehend beyond the physical into the eternal. It's only reserved for specific individuals, according to what Paul is saying. Amen. Amen, indeed. Now, having said that, just before you go any further, yes, I just want to clarify something. Mm -hmm. You were talking about the release of the seal. I understood you to mean that this happened before the rapture, but after the beginning of Sorrows. Well, depends on what you mean, a seal. I, I'm assuming well, you're referring to the seven the, seals. No, 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 until um, Daniel's seal to the end. What is the end that he's referring to? Oh, <coughs> the beginning of Sorrows. Okay, so then I, I understood it. Yeah, it's sealed up until that point. Beginning of Sorrows, it's going to be open. It contains a wisdom that this group that's been allocated, designated to receive it, I'm going to receive it, and it's going to be used for them to feed right. the flock. So all of a sudden, we all immediately become suddenly wiser. Well, <laughs> you're already. So you're already getting that wisdom. Otherwise, right. you wouldn't understand any of the things we're Agreed. talking about. But when that is released, it will be super wisdom. Well, it increases. Okay. Arithmetically and exponentially. Okay. Yes. So this, we're, we're seeing something brand new here, Mr. Jones. Did Paul have access to this wisdom? Sure. Okay. Definitely. That's right. I was able to write all this. Okay. I thought maybe you know for some reason it's toward the end end of the uh, conclusion of God's plan. No, no. Notice what he says. The Lord did it in eternity for our. <coughs> he includes himself for our glory. So Paul was the prim premier vessel He's the of this wisdom. wisdom. Yes. Even the other apostles couldn't comprehend on his level. Just since we're here, the unsealing of the seven seals, when does that happen? Uh, I've got it as the second half of the seven year period. Yeah. Well, actually, you can't put a time element on it because it's an eternity. From an earth perspective, it sets in motion the tribulation period. The second half of the seven year period or the first half? First the half. Okay. First half. So in other words, the appearance of... Yeah, when the, he opens the, the seals and the white horse goes out, right. pale horse and all the rest of it, that's basically the first half progressing into the second half. Which Antichrist is ruling at that time? 
Uh, the first one. Okay, then it's, one. it's earlier than I thought. All right. Yeah. But let's go on. Now, there is an a additive here. I want to compare. want you to compare two scriptures to mm -hmm. the close. Go back to Matthew 24. You're going to see something interesting in this. Verse 45 again. This happens, this faithful servant sets forth <coughs> the time of the beginning of sorrows to feed those that he has been commissioned from eternity to feed. This is the XY axis crossing at this time. Matthew 24, 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath, hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. <coughs> this is a person called from eternity for just this period of time. He's automatically going to set himself in motion because he receives the door open and he's going to willingly step right through, hit the ground running and begin to do what he's been called to do. Now, Turn to Luke, the 12th chapter. Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household <laughs> to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Now how do we reconcile these two? We reconcile these two when the XY axis crosses. What does this mean? This means Matthew 24 is talking about the Prototokos who has been given his mandate in eternity. And when the XY axis crosses, he steps into his calling. This is talking about the individual who has a temporal calling at the beginning of sorrows. He is at that sufficient commitment that he too wants to do this and he too sets forth the Lord says who shall well what's the contingency his willingness to do it if he was willing to do it the Lord is going to say go for it just like my son here it's an open opportunity for everybody. Amen, Brother Jones. Absolutely. 